Don't touch that dial. I know it's the month of July, but the Cannes Film Festival, normally in May, is opening this evening. Uh, organizers made a bet and a winning one that uh, it would be okay because lockdown restrictions would be relaxed. That happened just a few short weeks ago. 74th edition, let's cross to France 24 film critic Lisa Nesselson and our very own Olivia Salazar Winspear. Hello, Francois, and welcome to uh, Encore in Cannes, where we're delighted to be live from the 74th edition of the festival on its opening night. As you said, I'm joined by Lisa Nesselson, our film critic. Lisa, hi. hi. Now, we are quite shocked, I think, <laughs> shocked as many people to actually be here this evening. I think for a long time, we never thought we'd get inside those mythical screening rooms behind me. The event was cancelled last year, of course, due to the pandemic. But it is a different edition this year, isn't it? Oh, absolutely, and so under the wire, because here in France, they only gave permission, the government only gave permission six days ago for uh, theatrical venues to go from 65% capacity to 100%. So uh, that, that worked out rather well, because the theaters behind us hold thousands of people. And uh, from a health standpoint, um, it's, um, you know, there's a lot of countries out there. People come from over 100 of them for this event, which is the biggest film event in the world and also the biggest film market where films are bought and sold. And uh, people have different standards for vaccinations and, and being told whether you're healthy enough to walk into those buildings or not. So I have a tip from Celine Dion. When she doesn't have enough saliva, when she's in the middle of a concert, she says she bites down very hard on her own tongue to create some. It turns out you don't just spit in a jar for a COVID-19 test. <laughs> you need a lot of saliva. And so people are trading stories about how they never thought it would be so hard hard to spit for the cause of science. It's true, it's, uh, it's quite a challenge around here. Now, uh, festival director Thierry Frémaux, as you mentioned, Francois took a gamble on this festival and he ended up with quite a lot of films. So we managed to get to sit down with him and speak about that just as proceedings got underway. The artists worked and they worked a lot. All the movies we saw took us on a beautiful journey. We saw some great films, so we wanted to show them to everyone. It's an exceptional year. There was no cinema for a year, so we can't complain now that we have a lot of films to watch. It's an important choice because the films that we show here will then be shown in theaters. What we'll be showing here at Cannes in the next few days is basically what the theaters will be showing in the months to come. Now, in terms of the official selection, the films competing for that prestigious Palme d'Or, there are 24 films in competition. Lisa, tell us a little bit about how you describe the selection this year and what you're most looking forward to. Well, I'm looking forward to everything because this is the moment of the festival I like best when everything is just a magical name on paper and you have no idea whether it's good, bad, whether you wish the director had never been born or you can't wait to see it again. Um, and, you know, they couldn't ask the jury to see more than 24 films, but there were more than that that, uh, that they enjoyed. Um, it's, um, it's a selection out of the 24. Seven of them are French films. More than that would probably be unseemly. But uh, there was a year and a half of work to choose from and France really only stopped shooting films for about two months out of the lockdown period so uh, they had an embarrassment of riches and they went to town but what this is is a snapshot of presumably the best filmmaking available from a very good sampling of countries and directors. Now, the first of those films to screen in competition this evening is called Annette. This is a left-field musical from a cult French director, Leo Skaggs, with music from the American art rock group uh, Sparks. And there's a starry couple at the centre of this story. They're played by Marion Cotillard and Adam Driver. And we got the chance to sit down with them uh, to hear a bit more about the film before the big reveal. It feels, uh, it feels great. You know, uh... Um, this festival has always been, you know, uh, my favorite one, and even before I came here, I looked to it as the, you know, the, you know, the place where great movies are. So um, to be the opening film with this one in particular, with one that was took seven years of us kind of putting it together, it, 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 I have, I've, clearly I haven't thought about it and what it means. I'm just kind of going with it. 
It's an immense pleasure to be back here at the Cannes Film Festival, the festival I love passionately. And it's so great to be here presenting this movie, made by a director I've admired for so long and who played a role in my desire to become an actor and act in movies. It's about the need for recognition, the need for an actor to be recognized and how he or she will adapt to becoming famous and also the fall from fame, the disgrace. How fame can build you up, but also destroy you. And you can watch the full interview with Adam Driver here on France 24 at 10.15 p.m. Paris time. Now, going back to that official selection, the judges, the jury, they'll be weighing up who gets those precious prizes. As you mentioned, Lisa, they're going to have a very busy screening schedule. The jury itself is made up of five women and three men. We have uh, American actress and producer Maggie Gyllenhaal, French actor Taha Rahim, and French pop star Mylène Farmer. Now, they're all presided over by, of course, the iconic Spike Lee. He's behind me on the poster, the first black jury president in the history of the festival, who's blazed a trail from Brooklyn, New York, all the way here to the Riviera. In a baseball cap and small round glasses, Spike Lee needs no introduction. I've done this before. <laughs> Born in Atlanta in 1957, his mother was a teacher and his father a jazz musician. Shelton Jackson Lee has said his mission is to hold a mirror up to America. He's often focused on the African-American experience. His 1992 biopic on civil rights icon Malcolm X propelled him to superstardom. When you say homage to Spike Lee, it's not just Spike Lee. You're paying homage to all the people in front of and the behind, in front of and behind the camera that made these films possible. Lee branched out, directing music videos for pop and hip hop stars. After film, his passion is basketball. As well as He Got Game, he's directed a documentary on legendary Californian player Kobe Bryant. So, I do it. Big game for the Lakers, big game for their opponent, the defending champion San Antonio Spurs. Look at the West Coast. Yeah, showtime, showtime, yeah. In 2006, Inside Man became his biggest hit commercially bringing in $180 million worldwide. Twelve years later, he took the grand jury prize at Cannes for Black Klansmen, based on the true story of an African-American who infiltrated the Ku Klux Klan at the end of the 1970s. During its production, a young woman was murdered in Charlottesville while attending an anti-racism protest. Spike Lee chose to dedicate his film to her. I called Susan Bro. Susan is the mother of heaven, so I, wa I wanted her permission. So I'm asking her, dude, can I include the footage that shows your daughter being murdered? And uh, she gave me her blessing and said, use it. As the coronavirus pandemic gathered pace, Spike Lee paid tribute to New York's healthcare workers, while his film, The Five Bloods, went to a Netflix release. Now the pioneering director is to add another accolade to his resume, awarding the Palme d'Or at the Cannes closing ceremony on July 17th. Now, Spike Lee is certainly one of the big names at the festival this year, but I believe Jodie Foster is also here on opening night. Lisa, she has a long history with the festival, doesn't she? You, that, you could say that. Uh, she was here when she was an adolescent, when she was 12 years old, having made Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver, written by Paul Schrader, in which she played a 12-year-old prostitute. And that was a stunning idea back in 1976, and it's still kind of a stunning idea. And, of course, that film went on to win the highest prize they give out here, the Palm d'Or, the Golden Palm. Jodie Foster has been back many times, but especially behind the camera as a director. And she brought two very fine films, The Beavers, starring Mel Gibson, and uh, just four years ago, five years ago, um, Money Monster, starring George Clooney and uh, Julia Roberts. So people come here from all over the world hoping to find young talent that goes on to be that astonishing. There is a lot of focus here in Cannes on the official selection films, those competing for the Palm Door, but there are other things going on as well, sidebar selections, even some new ones this year. 
Uh, well, be, as I said, they, they had a year and a half worth of films to look at, and they didn't want to not program good ones, and they couldn't ask the jury to see more than three movies a day. So they created a new section called Con Premiere, which conveniently works well in English and in French. And it is not an insult to be put in that section. Some people think that, but you're an excellent uh, company. You've got films by Oliver Stone, Arno de Plachin, uh, um, Gaspar Noé, and this year's honoree for an honorary palm, Marco Bellocchio. Indeed. And there's another sidebar section which reflects a more global concern, and that's the environment. There's a series of screenings under the header Climate and Cinema, Cinema and Climate. What sort of features are we looking at here? Well, I've seen the trailer for Louis Garrel's new film, and it looks very entertaining. There's no reason why tackling ecology has to be boring or dull or not funny. I think it's a comedy. Bigger Than Us concerns a couple, played by Louis Garrel and his real wife's real life spouse, Leticia Casta, and apparently they have a young young son who unbeknownst to them is very, very serious about saving the planet. And it's not just on screen either. There's some very practical measures here at the festival this year which are aiming to reduce our carbon footprint too. Well, uh, the festival director has said that um, big events, uh, the time has come where it would just be so irresponsible to not take into account the amount of waste that's conceivably generated. And so they've uh, said no more plastic bottles. Uh, almost everything has gone paperless, which for analog generation people like me is a bit of a problem. And uh, people are at least conscious of maybe trying to reuse that paper cup twice. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Now, Lisa, very quickly, if it's going to be a very busy two weeks for us with a very busy screening schedule. But if you had to pick out an absolute must-see at the festival, what will it be? Well, I'm very much looking forward to Oliver Stone's JFK Revisited, but uh, we've been waiting a while for a film that was loyal to the festival. It would have been in the 2020 edition had it happened, and that's Wes Anderson's The French Dispatch, shot right here in the French city of Angoulême with an absolute dream cast. And uh, speaking of analog, it's about people who work for a newspaper, one of those things you hold in your hands before television, this medium, came along. It <laughs> certainly is creating a lot of buzz here on the Croisette, on the Riviera, Francois. Well, that's all from us. Thank you very much for the tips, Lisa. And do remember to check in with Encore in Cannes every evening at 10.15 Paris time. We'll also be bringing you film reviews and news updates throughout the day. We'll leave you with a film that I know you're excited to see, Francois, and that is Wes Anderson's The French Dispatch here on France 24. All right, many thanks uh, for that. escape a bright future on the Great Plains, Arthur Howitzer Jr. transformed the series of travelogue columns into the French Dispatch, a factual weekly report on the subjects of world politics, the arts, high and low, and diverse stories of human interest. You don't think it's almost too seedy this time? No, I don't. For decent people. It's supposed to be charming. He assembled a team of the best expatriate journalists of his time, Berenson, Sazerac, Kremens, Roebuck Wright. These were his people. Just try to make it sound like you wrote it that way on purpose.